Charles Causley was born in Launceston in Cornwall in 1917. His father was wounded in the First World War and died in 1924 of the effects on his lungs of German gas, when Causley was only seven years old. Eden Rock is one of his later works and was published in the volume Collected Poems. In the poem, the speaker describes a vision of his mother and father as they once were, or how he imagines them to have been when they were young. His mother is setting up a picnic on a cloth, whilst his father is skimming stones on the water, accompanied by his dog. As soon as they see that he has arrived on the other side of the stream, they beckon and call for him to join them. More than just an imagined meeting between himself and his parents long after their deaths, the poem is an exploration of the strength of family bonds, as well as a meditation on the process of dying and what lies beyond. The title, Eden Rock, is a made-up name for a possibly real place remembered from childhood, which Causley himself suggested in an interview might be somewhere on Dartmoor. The name itself is an oxymoron. Eden, with its allusion to the Garden of Eden, suggests heaven or an unearthly paradise, whilst rock has connotations of something solid, very much of the earth with firm foundations, and a symbol, perhaps, of the solidity and strength of family relationships. The poem has five stanzas, which are quatrains, although in the fifth stanza, Causley has detached the final line to separate it from the rest of the poem. He uses the first person and the present tense, which gives it a sense of immediacy, as though the speaker is actually experiencing this vision as he writes or has such a vivid memory of a dream that it replays in his mind. The poem does not have a formal metrical scheme, but instead seems to follow the rise and fall of natural speech, adding to its simplicity. The extensive use of caesura and enjambment punctuates the poem to give it a lilting, dreamlike rhythm, whilst the almost exclusive use of half-rhyme where it is only the word's final consonant sounds that match, is slightly off-key and gives it a haunting quality. The language is deceptively simple and belies the poem's more complex exploration of death and dying, one of the two most significant rites of passage in a person's life. The first line, They are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock, is quite cryptic, and sets the mysterious, almost dreamlike tone of the rest of the poem. The way in which the poet uses a pronoun, they, to refer to his parents before he has explicitly mentioned them, not only adds to the mysterious tone of the poem, but is also an indication of his closeness to them. It is as though they do not need an introduction. The use of the word somewhere in Somewhere Beyond Eden Rock is also very vague and adds to the sense of mystery and ambiguity. Although the poem appears to be a simple retelling of a memory, it is clear that there is more to it than this. The speaker's father is 25, and we find out in the next stanza that his mother is 23. Causley's father was 38 when he died in 1924, meaning that he was already in his early 30s when his son was born. Clearly, then, Causley never knew his father when he was 25. We can therefore surmise that time is irrelevant and that he is evoking an idealised younger version of his parents. His father is described as wearing the same suit of genuine Irish tweed. Irish tweed is a sturdy woollen fabric in natural colours and at the time the poem is set, it would have been hand rather than machine woven. The poet is at pains to tell us that it is genuine, and the implication is, therefore, that it would have been expensive, suggesting that his father is dressed in his best clothes. The word same to describe the suit suggests a merging of time, as his father's younger self is wearing a suit that the speaker remembers from when he knew him. This issue of time is picked up in the adverb still, when referring to his father's terrier jack, still two years old, as though the dog is frozen in time at a particular age. 
This static image of his father with his dog slowly starts to come to life as we find out that Jack is trembling at his feet, which gives the poem the quality of a tableau vivant. The poet uses the second stanza to describe his mother. She is 23 and is wearing a sprigged dress. Sprigged refers to fabric, which has a repeating pattern of small leaves or flowers. This dress is also drawn at the waist, suggesting that she has adorned it with a belt, and she has decorated her straw hat with a ribbon. She and his father appear to be in their holiday clothes, suggesting that this is a special occasion. The fact that they are both so young and dressed in this way preserves them in time and creates an idealised image of them. His mother has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass as she begins to set up a picnic. The adjectives stiff and white suggest both purity and perfection, as the implication is that the cloth is immaculate from having been boiled and starched to get it clean. His mother's hair, the colour of wheat, i.e. golden, takes on the light and is a beautiful image suggesting that the sunshine makes her appear to glow with an almost angelic purity. In the third stanza, the setting up of the picnic vividly evokes the time period, which can be inferred from their clothes and the items she puts out to be the early 20th century. His mother pours tea from a thermos. A thermos is a brand name for a vacuum flask that keeps liquids hot. She adds milk which has obviously been decanted out of a larger vessel into an old HP sauce bottle with an improvised screw of paper for a cork. She slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. The use of the adjective same three suggests a familiarity, an intimacy and a feeling of completeness. Three plates, one for each of his parents and himself, that comforts the poet. The picnic is not extravagant. They are simply drinking tea from cups made of tin, evoking the family's humble origins, and yet, the way in which he describes it in such minute detail suggests the perfection he sees. The mood changes in the fourth stanza, which is introduced with the simile, the sky whitens as if lit by three suns. This moment is clearly significant, signalled as it is by the reference to the number three. Three has been regarded as an important number throughout history, as it symbolises harmony, wisdom and understanding, as well as the past, the present and the future, all of which can be said to be evoked in this poem. The image also alludes to the Holy Trinity, i.e. the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, as well as linking back to the parents and their only Son. The extreme light and the way in which the sky becomes unnaturally white hints at the arrival of something supernatural. We can sense that this is a signal that something of great importance is about to happen to him as his mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. We now know that he is separated from them and that to get to them he must cross the water. The word drifted in its past participle form is not usually used in this way as an adjective but helps to enhance the serene tone as it has connotations of slowness and lack of purpose. This stream could be an allusion to the four rivers that bordered the Garden of Eden, or to the River Styx, which formed a border between the world of the living and the underworld in Greek mythology, across which people were ferried when they died. The drifted stream is therefore very probably a metaphor for the threshold that we must pass through in order to enter the afterlife. The serene tone continues as his father just whiles away the time as he spins a stone along the water. His parents leisurely beckon from the other bank. If they are in the underworld, they are already dead, and there is no hurry. They call to him, See where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. Crossing is a common euphemism for dying and they appear reassuring as they guide him to cross the stream to leave the earthly realm for the afterlife, to be reunited with them. Once more we realise the way in which time does not have any influence here. 
presumably causally as he approaches death as an old man, and yet his parents, who are giving him all the love and encouragement you would expect a parent to give their child when attempting something they think is difficult, are young. The final line of the fifth stanza, I had not thought it would be like this, is separated from the preceding three lines so that it stands alone. This gives it prominence as the speaker reflects on the vision that he has just related. The tense of the final line changes from the present tense to the pluperfect, which is used to denote an action that is completed for another past point in time. The tone of this last line is ambiguous as it stands alone and does not indicate the level of surprise, if any, that he feels at this revelation. It does, however, indicate a change in the speaker's attitude towards death as a result of the vision. The implication is that he used to be afraid of it, but is not any more. It is a beautiful and serene process where you are reunited with the people you have loved and lost. Thanks for watching. I'd really appreciate any questions or comments below. I look forward to hearing from you.